The Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda, Dr. Hakana Rugunda, the trustee from the Foundation, Rotary Foundation, the distinguished district governors, past, present, and elect. I recognize you all. Rotarians, distinguished Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen. I know the Prime Minister is leaving soon. I'm glad that he has chosen to sit for a minute. I will try to be as quick as possible. I have broken down my presentation today into two parts. And before I go into the main thrust of that, allow me to read the first part. I think it will make it easier to understand where I'm coming from. Make it your business to care about others. Every year for the past few decades, thousands of young people from rich countries, mainly from the Northern Hemisphere, enter the aid system or the industry of caring for others. Many come through the existing institutions, these days often called NGOs, as interns or a short project or on a short project, a study tour or research grant. On their first trip to a poor country, many of them hit the ground and fall in love with the development and sometimes our ladies. It is exotic, altruistic, exciting, and it changes their whole outlook on life. They learn so much. They want to keep coming back. Some do. Or they might go home and get into some other career, but stay involved in, in some way or the other, by donating money or volunteering. Or later in life, they sponsor their own project, like a water well or a school in a poor remote village. It is heartening to note that a good part of humanity still has hope and gives generously, especially like Rotarians, priests, nuns. There are over 33,000 Rotary clubs worldwide and over 1.2 million members across the world doing this wonderful work that you do here in Uganda. I speak on my behalf and on behalf of many Ugandans as we approach the end of 2019 with my hand on heart and say thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful work you are doing as missionaries or crusaders of the less fortunate. The bedrock of civil society is formed of local groups concerned primarily with the welfare of their fellow citizens, living life with a purpose and having a meaningful life. Today, I would like to propose a not so new idea. And I go out on a limb here, but bear with me, please. The idea is pro-business aid. And when I go into the heart of my presentation, you'll understand why. Pro-business pro aid can never compete in the same way as charity does. Because charity touches the heart. Business simply doesn't. Support for the aid system has merged today with religious feelings over time to become a modern day crusade. The overall system is now so well established that it will not evolve or change anytime soon. But there is a compelling need to change strategy, especially in Africa with our fast growing population and low income growth. Today, I would like to make a humble suggestion of small steps you and I can take to make a difference, but in a more sustainable way. Because there is no single world leader to set things right at the vast scale we ultimately need for sustainable, especially for sustainability, especially in light of the fast rising population of Africa. Today, we are about 1.1 billion people in Africa, but set to become 2.5 billion by the year 2050. Uganda is growing fast with 1.5 million new babies every year and rising. How will we manage this explosion, the youth explosion? The social services just can't grow at this pace. Public schools, healthcare and hospitals, police, courts of law, prisons, roads, housing, food security, for the last 100 years, the global financial capital is concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere. And the labor is largely in the Southern Hemisphere. 
If this substantial capital does not move south, then labor will inevitably have to move north. And so the northward migration will get bigger and more vociferous. My idea today is to ask you, individually and collectively, to help mentor someone in a small or medium-sized business, SME. To stay afloat in business so that they can grow, create jobs, the much-needed jobs, and succeed. I walked that road. I walked that road. And I stand before you to give testimony. For I had nothing. And I have realized I can make a difference. That is the best way, or maybe the only way, for real sustainable development in Uganda. All of you have had a reasonable education. All of you have some wealth, some skill, opportunity to make a difference. To assist your local business sector. Much as Ugandans are highly entrepreneurial, the attrition rate, the failure rate, is extremely high. The understanding of the language of money is very limited. Simple habits of saving and investing, financial discipline, financial literacy, the levels are extremely low. Promote pro-business policies for our government. Go to your local business school and volunteer. If you want to help end poverty, find a pro-business project to help as a Rotarian. If you're a decision maker in a large corporate with a CSR policy, divide your budget for corporate, corporate social responsibility into two. Use half for charity in humanitarian or government or NGO projects, and the other half to help foster a local business. The key is to make sure that most of your charity money goes for refugees, medical, water, education, health, and emergency relief. That is a given. For economic development, support the small businesses to become sustainable. Microfinance loans, business training, and business technical support are simple ways to start helping local business. Once a nation achieves a somewhat vibrant or normal business sector, a normal local philanthropy sector will, will grow alongside it. What you are doing is great philanthropy, but we need a bigger side of the industry growing in Uganda. Finally, I see a role for business schools and their students in less developed countries in the world. In the past two decades, the number of business schools in China has grown from 80 to more than 3,200. In India, it has more than 4,000 business schools. We need business schools that support local businesses with dedicated research and trained graduates. At Makerere, most students graduate without the slightest empathy or connection for the surrounding local business community. Most graduates graduate like a fish out of water, completely out of water. Business must be keen to play a key role in solving the problems of poverty, but remain cognizant that there are many problems it cannot solve. There will always be a need for government agencies to provide public services. Business, I must emphasize, makes the prosperity that pays for these public services. The government needs taxes like VAT charged on consumption and needs businesses to declare profit because if you don't make profit, you don't pay taxes. So you see the strong correlation between strong businesses and strong governments. I looked at the numbers in South Africa. 5,000 businesses pay 90% of the taxes that support that country. And they provide 56% of the jobs. 5,000, out of 5.6 million. In Uganda, 1,800 businesses pay 80% of the taxes. Our tax base is simply too narrow. We need to do things differently. And on that note, I move to a little story, if you will bear with me. In 2008, 2009, I was invited to Marrakesh in Morocco because I was recognized as the best dealer for Africa. Competing with South Africa, with Nigeria, I wondered why these people had invited me and gave me a first class ticket. I used to go business class, but first class ticket to Morocco. I met the CEO, a great man by his those days, called Stephen Elop. Nokia, as many of you know, lost the ground it was standing on. In 10 years, Nokia is no more. The earth moved from below it. This man, when he was leaving, 
he called all the staff and told us a story about what had happened in the world and the need for change in behavior. If you don't change, the world keeps evolving. Rotary has done great things. And you here must continue doing the work that Rotary is doing. But you must recognize the world in which we live because there are changes happening all the time. He told a story of a burning platform in the North Sea. Someone was asleep, one of the workers, on this platform. Late in the night, he had an explosion. And this fire began. He looked up, everyone was running for cover. And with an oil rig, because of the smell of oil, that high calorific value, it's so flammable. The fire was growing so fast, and the platform was burning that they were on. The platform was burning so fast, this man ran to the edge of the platform. And he had to make a decision in a split second. What do I do? Stay and this fire engulfs you because the blazing, the smoke was extremely high. Or jump into the cold water. Now the platform is 30 meters high. Now 30 meters is much taller than this building right here. He had to make a split second decision to jump in the icy cold water or stay on that burning platform. Many of his colleagues could not risk to jump, but there was a need to jump because you are on a burning platform. He saw his people running. Many of them already are light. And by that time you jump, it's too late. You will die. You won't recover. He jumped and stayed in that cold, water, cold icy water for almost an hour before he was rescued. The good thing is he lived to tell his story. The point the CEO was making was we need to change our attitude, we need to change our thinking, and ultimately we need to radically change our behavior. When you're on a burning platform, it's even more important. 30 years ago, 33 years before the NRM government came, life was extremely hard for me at a very personal level. I had no idea what was going to happen. When these people returned from exile, I was so happy to see them. Many of them had known them as my parents' friends. But I'd lost my father during that period of Idi Amin. And it was a very hard period because life kept going south. It was only one way. And I had to change because now the space had been opened up. And there was new hope for Uganda. A chance for us to try and stand and count yourself as a Ugandan. That's when I began to love my country, Uganda. Otherwise, I was always in anger. And I had a big problem, even with the Lord. I was very religious. But I had an argument with the Lord every night before I went to sleep. I was in a school called Namasagali before I went to Nyakasura. And I would pray at night and then cry to sleep for almost two years. Crying, why did God do this to us? But God, Uganda changed. And we've had a rise in almost every field since then. We thank our leaders. I learned that it was going to be a long journey, and I was determined to go the distance. All too often, we, are not, we don't have enough resolution. We are not resolved to go the distance. We don't have that grit, that perseverance. I also learned that you've got to focus. If you don't focus, you will be distracted. There are so many distractions in life. But nearly anybody, and certainly everybody amongst you, can make a difference in people's lives. I know the work you're doing is great as philanthropy. But hold somebody's hand and help them to think. Because the way our population is growing, we're in, we're standing on a burning platform. My journey with Simba Telecom, I'll not go into the details. But that helped me to see that you can make a difference. By just being in the right place at the right time, there's nothing I did radically different. Many of my classmates were much smarter than me. But focus, determined to go the distance, made a very big difference. I rolled out in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Kenya, and that's what helped me to go. And then I realized, this honeymoon will change. The telecom business, we are getting 10%. Today we get less than 1% margin. The ground keeps changing. You have to evolve. You have to diversify your portfolio. I went into the hotels. I'm glad that you're here. I don't have to say much about it. Simply because you want to buttress your security, your income, so that we don't go through what we went through in the past. Having got into the hotel business, I went on to build another hotel, Skies. And that is one of those properties that helps you feel it's a good investment. You've arrived. The returns are not so high, 
But you're making something that you feel proud as a Ugandan that now at least we have done something as local Ugandans. I couldn't risk to stay on in the hotel business. I diversified into property, office buildings, apartments, and then also into energy. I went into energy because there was a shortage of electricity. And this was really a preserve of the foreign direct investors. When I went for that license to get a power-up license, it was extremely hard. All the people who I worked with in government, they knew me. But they said, forget it. Get out of here. You will not get this license. Leave the foreigners to come on board. And I really struggled. I went to the IGG. I went to the president complaining that I want to do this. And he told me, if you think you won the bid, go and take them to court. And that was the president. The prime minister called me, why are you fighting your own government? You're trying to sue the government? But I thought I had won a bid, but they had refused to give me a license. Eventually, I got a small license for 20 megawatts. Then I went, and thanks to the government, I went to try and raise money for that license. And 20 megawatts was hard to swallow. It was a real struggle to raise the funding for that. But with perseverance, we raised the 20 megawatts, we built to 50, and now we have 90 megawatts installed, just as backup for the country. Today, my biggest challenge, what I see as I prepare to retire, is the threat or the blessing we have of this population. When NRM came to power, we had 14 million people. Today, we are 44 million. And by 2050, we shall be 100 million. By 2100, we shall be 200 million if we stay on this trajectory. To me, that is a ticking time bomb or a burning platform. Our contribution, 1.5 million babies, easily, every year. This is a picture of a mother. Those are all her children, nine children. And she's still in the race. She's still running. <laughs> Uganda's future. What will it look like? What do you want it to look like? Will the youth become a dividend or will they become a disaster? This depends on what you do today. Don't leave it to the government on its own. It is what you and I do to make a difference. We have a responsibility to make sure that we harness a big dividend out of our youth. They are so full of energy, hope, potential, but they need to be guided. And we have a role to play there. We can come and dine and do all these good things, but we shall go into a disaster zone unless we start doing something now. You see the traffic you see everyone becoming a border border. The police is trying their best to manage these people. But they are young. They are full of energy. They say, we want change. Let's move. Let's move. Anybody can mobilize them. We have to do something and start today thinking about this. We have a lot of challenges. But in the challenges are where the opportunities are. A lot of opportunity. If we can harness these vast challenges. And there brings my question. Do we just continue with charity and think that we shall, we shall solve the problem or invest half of our time, our effort, our money in supporting pro-business? Because I feel strongly this is what's going to change the direction we are going in. If Nokia didn't change, if they had changed in time, they probably would have survived. Apple came and swept them off their feet with the upper end of the market. So did Samsung. And today, the lower end of the market is dominated by Techno and Oppo. And Nokia is struggling to come back, but it's a whole, an appeal task. Change in attitude, change in behavior is a must. And my call to you is change. You can make a difference, each and every one. One hour, you spend a lot of time coming to Rotary. Once a week, you have the discipline, and I respect you. Fantastic work. I tried. I just couldn't. I love you all, but wow, what you do? Salute. I just couldn't do it. Some clubs are here, some at the other hotel. I come once in a while, I listen to what you're doing, and I am in awe. I really respect the discipline, that culture you have embedded. But imagine if all of you formed an army and said, let's train one small business at a time and help these people who have just a little bit too little financial knowledge. It's not about the money. Just holding their hand and guiding them, mentoring them, and these businesses grow. I know that if women are kept busy because we've got to play a bigger role and our government is making an effort to empower women and to suppress gender-based violence, we need to get more women doing business. And then naturally, that trajectory of population growing at that rate will just come down. Because after all, they are the ones who control it. The men have little, a very small role we play. 
We need women empowered, educated, and then they feel comfortable in what they are doing. We need to keep the men busy too. And get them in business. They must be doing something useful if we are to change our trajectory in Uganda. The ultimate challenge, of course, is how do we fight poverty? Poverty is a terrible thing. None of you in this room really understand poverty. You can be broke temporarily, but poverty gives you a sense of powerlessness that you just don't know. I was in northern Uganda, and I felt nobody in Kampala knows what it is to be powerless. A sense of hopelessness and frustration. And that's mainly because they just don't have a job. The land is beautiful, it's vast, and nothing is happening. These people need direction. All the leaders are there, and the leaders are trying, especially the political leaders, but they are so ill-equipped in knowledge and tools. You can make a difference. The absence of dignity, even here in Kampala. When a young man or young girl graduates, has spent three years to get a degree, and then spends three years looking for a job. They walk with their CV until the CV is completely tattered. The sole of their shoe is gone. And they lose hope. They lose dignity. Their self-esteem is gone. They go home. Even if they talk to their mother, they might, wow, go, you can't get a job. Even you, you're useless. You can't get a girlfriend. You can't, the girl can't get a boyfriend. Because you're not working. This week I was talking to my staff. All the staff at Protea, Simba Telecom, and Skies. And I apologized to them. I told them, I know I don't pay you enough. I work out how much I pay you. And I wonder how you manage to go to work every day, come home. We provide lunch and dinner. But how do you pay your rent? I know the salary is too little. But one thing is, I pay you on time. And they clapped. I always pay them the little we have agreed on on time. And I give them dignity. Because they are smart. They come to work. They have something. When you don't have a job, you lose your dignity. You end up in a tailspin, either you go into crime or prostitution or any of the other vices to try and eke out a living. And that's not acceptable. We need to create jobs. And the only way is by growing our business sector. Inequality, another big challenge in our country. The gap between the well-to-do and those who have nothing is growing. This is unacceptable. We need to get people out of poverty, but also we cannot let these gaps keep widening. If there's a way we could solve this quickly, I would say what it is. It's, an, it's a hard challenge and it's a global challenge. But a gap like that one, where a girl who's born in Norway is almost guaranteed to live to a healthy age of 80 plus. And in Uganda, we still have a lot of challenges. Not only with health, but also with education. Then after that, our societal values. Because you're a girl, you can't own land. You can't own this. Many of you today are empowered, but we need to change that culture. And you've got to be ambassadors of change. You lead the change. Giving water, helping with medicine is not enough, but go and make a difference in your societies. I feel, as I get older, that I see some of these social challenges, and I feel it is my duty to stop chasing money now and go and work for the communities. <laughs> People have got to understand the simple rule that without savings, you cannot make investments. A very simple rule. And if on, the only savings Uganda has is the money which we, have, we, are, we save with NSSF, which is forced upon us by law, otherwise we wouldn't be saving. That mindset has got to change. In China, in India, in Malaysia, in Thailand, all of them have now got it so wired into them from early age. You have got to save. You have to be frugal with money to make a difference. And that's how you succeed. Here... We've got too many role models who shoot to the top overnight and we don't know where their money has come from and then they disappear. And those are our celebrities. I won't say the names. <laughs> I want to end by saying the work you do, this gift of giving is amazing. You are either a donor or you are a beneficiary. None of you in this room are beneficiaries. You are donors, all of you. The fact that you are giving, that heart of Ubuntu, not a being too, heart of giving is amazing. We must keep giving. Ken.
today when I was leaving, I knew I had to give a little contribution. So I talked to my wife and we agreed to give a contribution to Rotary. I've always done so. So I came with, we agreed with her 20 million shillings. But now I am a bit challenged. I feel we should have done a bit more. So I can't make decisions outside our arrangement with my wife. So, shh. Chatham rules apply. What we say and do here stays here. She shouldn't know. Give me time slowly, I give 100 million shillings. Yeah. 